you're driving your car and uh, all of a sudden the, the red and blue go on behind you. Your heart stops. You know, oh, oh, I've been going 15 over. I'm in trouble. You know, some people start their day off without breakfast. I am blessed because usually Renee makes me breakfast in the morning. Um, especially hot cereal. I like hot cereal. And it just kind of fills my tummy for the day. The breakfast that Jesus made for the disciples was far more than malt meal or oatmeal. This is one of those lessons that when I was down in uh, South Florida, I always wanted to take my confirmation class out on the ocean. And since we lived on the Atlantic Ocean, the sun would rise in the east. I'd love to have gone out there and made breakfast for them on the beach. Never happened. And as I told my our, our, our discussion group, Bible discussion group on Wednesday, I also wanted to have a sunrise service there. But I'm telling you, the beach is reserved for years for, for Easter. John always refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loves. He never talks about himself in the first person, for second person. It's, just, it's always the disciple who Jesus loved. And Jesus did love John. He showed it from the cross when he said, Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your woman, or your mother. He knew John would be a good guy. He knew John would, was, what, was, what was going to be ahead for John. He knew John would end up dying of a natural death of old age. But then there's Peter. Then there's Peter. Peter who said, I don't know him. I'm not with him. I don't even know the man. Denied Jesus all throughout that night. Three times. So make no mistake. You know, when, when, um, when Jesus had appeared to the other disciples, there was more pressing business at hand. Peter never got the opportunity to sit and break bread or eat fish with Jesus on a more personal basis. So, you can imagine some of the guilt that, that Peter probably still had. For if you remember right, when, I feel so confined up here. Sorry, Chris. For if you remember right, when, when um, he had denied him three times, one of the Gospels says that he and Jesus made eye contact. Jesus knew. Jesus knew he had denied him. Jesus knew. And Peter knew that Jesus knew. So here they are. Peter is so excited to see Jesus. He still has all that guilt and he comes ashore. Now, I've taught this before, but I'm going to say it again. Uh, the sense of smell is one of the most acute senses. It brings back memories. How many of you remember memories of somebody's cooking or what it smelled like, you know? Or, or maybe, maybe you remember your grandma's house, what that smelled like. Or have you ever, ever been walking along and someone walks by and there's a perfume that they're wearing that triggers a memory because, oh, that's, who used to wear that? Well, here we are on the beach. Jesus has a charcoal fire going with thing with the fish being cooked on it. We're on that beach there. But what was going on when Peter denied Jesus? What was burning? A charcoal fire. And could you imagine the smell, the sense of smell that he must have had that associated Jesus charcoal fire? That sense of guilt must have been horrendous. And so as the morning goes on, Jesus says three times, three times, do you love me more than these? Lord, you know I do. And Jesus didn't say, then why the heck did you not even say you knew me? He didn't do that. He 
could have, but he didn't. He gave Peter grace. He forgave Peter for what he had done. Lord, you know I love you. And he gave him the, the, uh, the directions three times, feed my sheep. And then he talked about how Peter would die on a cross. But that whole account there, if you've ever lived with something that you're extremely guilty, feel guilty about, you're guilt-ridden that you, whatever it might be, and it doesn't have to be something bad. It might be, you know, um, uh, I feel guilty because I didn't talk to this person as they walked by. I blew them off. If you ever have guilt, I want to give you the good news right now that today, this morning, Christ is giving us breakfast again. For we receive the forgiveness when we come to the altar of the very body and the very blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given to us for the forgiveness of all of our sins. And so Christ feeds Peter. Today, Christ feeds us as we have forgiven. You confess sins and we have received forgiveness. That's one story. The other story is about Saul. Saul, the persecutor. Saul, the guy who pretty much was t taking names and making sure they were executed. Or at least talking about making sure that they, they would, would be at least persecuted. Saul's going down the road to Damascus. Why? Because he was just given the franchise to go to Damascus to, to uh, persecute Christians. He was the guy who was given the, the all authority to do that. And then, you know, I like to say that, think that this term came from there. He was knocked off his high horse, but he wasn't off on a horse. Then that light came. I want you to imagine <clears throat> you're driving your car, and uh, all of a sudden, the, the red and blue go on behind you. Your heart stops. You know, oh, oh, I've been going 15 over. I'm in trouble. And that's just a, one of those times that you just you have to stop and take pause and notice what's going on. Well, Jesus didn't pull up behind Peter. This bright white light penetrated him. And it wasn't just him. It was those who were with him as well. Saul, why do you persecute me? Now there's a convicting sentence. And he says, my Lord, who are you? Now the word Lord in scripture can also be used as sir. He's not identifying him as the Messiah. He's in essence, you know, like you would say to the police officer, yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. May I have another, sir? Um, you know, as, as, as he's doing that, he's going to say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Paul was changed in that moment. In that very moment, Paul was, was changed. And, you know, you can say, how was law and gospel applied here? Well, was Paul converted right immediately back to good condition? No. He went blind. He went blind until he found Ananias. And then scales fell and he went out and he became the most incredible evangelist to the Gentiles. But something dramatic had to happen for that, for that to take place. Something dramatic had to happen for those scales to fall off of his eyes. That conversion that took place and he went out and told people about Christ. Somebody asked me a couple different times when I've been wearing purple in the last couple of days. Is that purple for Lily? The young girl who was, who was murdered. Actually, it wasn't. Going to a funeral later today, and I thought I'd wear something different. But tell me something, folks. The young girl, when she was 
announced that she was missing, everybody glued in on what was going on. Everybody prayed for her. And then when the horrific, horrific things, well, let me back up. Everyone was praying for her. And purple started to show around. I knew she was a Viking fan. Purple started to show up around. The community was drawn together. And even Eau Claire as, and Chippewa Falls as one community were drawn together. There was a commonality that people were, were in, engaged in. And then when we got the word that she had been murdered, our hearts sunk. And yet, again, people were engaged. They were glued to the TV to see what was going on. My confirmation kids and I had a talk about the importance of family. The importance of family and that I knew each one of them had a great family because I know their family. But one of the best things they could do is talk with their kids. And if their kids, ever, if their friends, not talk with their friends, if the friends ever say something bad about what's going on in the family that makes you think, tell somebody. Tell somebody. But brothers and sisters in Christ, here's the thing. That was a huge event for us. Eyes have been blinded, but now we see the scales are removed for our, from our eyes. And so we, like Paul, need to go out and preach the good news to everybody. The community came together. Are we going to hold it together? Or is it just going to, oh, that was yesterday's news. The scales need to fall from our eyes. Rather than being out there talking about this or that or, or talking badly about the church or not knowing what you're going to say about the church. Oh yeah, I go to church. All of this, the scales need to fall from our eyes so that we too, like Saul, can go forward and share the good news of Jesus Christ. A big event. I remember 2011. Big event. There were different big events through history. But this is a big event. This is a scary event. Like I said, our, our, our kids in confirmation talked about this. And people amongst themselves are talking about this. And so I say, let the scales fall from your eyes. That rather than persecuting or being indifferent or apathetic about God. You'll be like Paul and you'll be driven to take the good news to the people who need to hear it. I want you to remember that all week long. Think about that all week long. I also want you to remember that when, as you come to the, come to the um, table today, you're receiving breakfast from Jesus for the, for the forgiveness of sins and the sustenance for your faith.